Oh, oh God. You're not a God who disappoints, Father. Let every heart that's listening have an encounter with you. In Jesus' name. How many believe that God is true to His Word as you take your seats and hold your Bibles in your hands and open up to the book of John chapter 4? <clears throat> Come on now. How many of you believe that God is a God of a supernatural? He's, a, he's an unforgettable God. Come on now. I need, I need some praises in the house. You don't, you don't go to that heights of praise and that depths of worship and then you stay quiet. Don't switch on me, all right? Just stay at the same frequency of praise that you have entered into. Can I, can I have an amen, please? Can I have some shouts in the house of God this morning? The good thing is that you are now forced to shout louder and give God more praise than ever before because you have a mask over your face. So God needs to hear, Jesus needs to hear, Holy Spirit needs to hear, and the angels of heaven needs to hear, and the saints that are on the grandstands of heaven needs to hear your praise. Can somebody shout glory to God? This morning we begin in the month of May a, a new series called Hashtag Unforgettable. My time for a quantum leap. Hashtag, I don't think anybody's with me this morning. I said hashtag unforgettable. My time for a quantum leap. I don't believe that. By the time this message is over this morning, you will have, have a level of expectation that you have never reached or arrived at before. And as a result, whatever you expect becomes the level of faith that makes a demand on heaven. Did you hear what I just said? I said, when your expectation is at a level that you have never arrived at before, your expectation, your faith makes a demand on heaven to produce for you at the level of faith that you have never arrived at before. How many can say that's me this morning? Are you ready to receive? Are you ready to encounter like never before? Unforgettable. Write this first principle down as I want to kick it off. Life is filled with unforgettable moments. Life is filled with unforgettable moments. Created by unforgettable people. Who were scheduled to enter your life. Who were scheduled to enter your life at the right time by an unforgettable God. So life is filled with unforgettable moments created by unforgettable people who are scheduled to enter your life at the right time by an unforgettable God. Please shout Amen. The God you serve is an unforgettable God. If He's a God who is easily forgotten, then He's not worth worshipping. He's not worth being called your God. But our God He's an unforgettable God. He's a God who reminds us that we belong to Him. Reminds us that every one of us are adopted into His family, the eternal family. And through Jesus Christ, when we look at the cross of Calvary, we know that this unforgettable God creates unforgettable people or created unforgettable people, but He creates moments where we will encounter those unforgettable people so that we can rise higher and go further. You never meet somebody who is there scheduled by heaven to, to, to thrust you higher and then they walk out of your life and then you regress. God doesn't plan it that way. God doesn't allow you to meet people who become the pivotal moment of change in your season. And then they walk away and your life remains the same. He does not schedule things to remain the same. He, the only thing that remains is say, the same is His Word. His prophecies over your life. Every dream He's given you, it remains unchanged. And if you, in your decade, in your season, if you're not willing to become what God wants you to become, that blessed grace moves over to the next generation. And if you don't have children, it'll then move over to the one that is your sibling. And if, if you don't have siblings, then it'll move over to the one who's looking up to you and you may not even know it. But they will carry a mantle and they will run further than you have ever run. And they will do greater exploits than you have ever done. Is anybody going to allow somebody else to do more than they have done when you know that this is your season and you've got to do more for the glory of God? Shout hallelujah this morning. Nobody's going to take my place. Look at somebody and say, nobody's going to take my place. Say, I'm going to rise higher 
so that the ones that comes after me will stand upon my shoulders and do greater exploits than ever before. So life is filled with unforgettable people created by or, or unforgettable moments. Life is filled with unforgettable moments created by unforgettable people who are scheduled to enter your life at the right time by an unforgettable God. What if you are that unforgettable, unforgettable person that God has scheduled to enter somebody else's life so that you can create an unforgettable moment for them? What if you was that person? What if you missed an opportunity to become that unforgettable person because you are so focused and so distracted by everything that goes on around you that you now for have forgotten that you have something that somebody else will be greatly empowered with. And what the devil does in order to silence the lambs, the silencing of the lambs is the most dangerous place that any Christian could ever be at. Because when the devil silences the lambs of God, they no longer are an echo of what God has said in his word. Somebody shout, that's not me. So I am not about to be silenced when God had, has given me a passion. I'm not about to be silenced when God has given me a vision. I'm not, allowed to, uh, I'm not about to be silenced when God has called me to raise you up to uh, do greater exploits than anybody has ever done before. Are you hearing me at home? If you know what I'm talking about, would you please give God praise for a few moments? Give God praise even if you can't see the future. Give God praise even if you cannot see, your vision is clouded, give God praise anyway. Why? Because your praise breaks down the walls that stands before you. Your praise shatters every work of the enemy. Your praise destroys every chain that the enemy tries to lock you down into. Because when the, a Christian praises God, hell trembles. Come on. Angels assemble. When your praise the frequency of your praise is so deep and so loud and so great. Loud doesn't mean the amplified sound, but loud means that I will never be silenced. I praise God every chance I get because I know who my God is and I know what He is capable of and I know that He will do greater in these days than ever before. Are you that unforgettable person that God has scheduled to enter somebody's life in order to create an unforgettable moment for them? Are you that person? How many moments have you missed because you're going through so much in your life? How many times have you turned your face away from an, a person who needed that unforgettable moment? How many times have you closed your hand to that person that needed that unforgettable moment, that breakthrough that you know you carry? And how many unforgettable moments have you missed just because life has caught you unaware? Because there's so much of distraction, so many things that pull us away, so many uh, uh, past things that brings us back to that place. And we spend more time going round and round the mountains of defeat and despair and never break out of the same cycle in order to, uh, to arrive at where God wants us to be. Every single thing that you do could be an unforgettable moment for somebody else. I'm talking about when you're led by the Spirit of God, not when you're led by the flesh. When you're led by the Spirit of God, things change. Can somebody shout Amen? So this message, I believe with all my heart, is about to ignite moments that you have forgotten. This message, I believe, is going to rekindle your passion. It's going to rekindle your passion. For this ever-loving, everlasting God, this message is designed to ignite you and cause you to burn with passion like never before so that you will never again be found wandering down the dead-end road of despair. Because every time you step back to yesterday, the devil pulls you closer to the world. Every time you look back at yesterday, he destroys every vision that heaven had set before you. He destroys the dream. He destroys the desires. And he brings a reminder of painful moments for as long as he can keep you there. He wins over your destiny. But God has not called a church of Christ, a kingdom church. He's not called a Christian 
a, a Christ-like person. He's not called you to walk a defeated road and give more glory to the enemy, but he's called you to walk a road of victory and give him alone all the glory for what he has done in your life. If you know God's been good to you, pre please praise him. If you know God's been good to you, please give him glory. Come on. Only God could have brought you this far. Only God could have given you what you got. Only God could have blessed you with the talents that you have. Only God could have brought you to a place without unforgettable people oh come on now look at the person next to you and say you are so unforgettable not because of your big nose but because of your big character come on now so as we look at John chapter 4 we're going to read a few verses this morning what if today is your unforgettable moment what if today is that moment where your entire life finally quantum leaps into that dream you've been begging God for. What if that this is your moment? Anything's possible with God. Right? We believe that. We say it. Confess this. Say unforgettable. This is my time for a quantum leap. John chapter 4 verse number 1 as we look at this particular portion of scripture which as a matter of fact I've never seen it through the lens of a quantum leap before. <laughs> I don't think anybody has, but let's look at how Jesus unfolds the truth of this particular event to last us decades so that when we read it in 2021, thousands of years later, that we now see something that we can expect. How of you know that every words preached in an atmosphere with revelation becomes the prophecy of your life? I've taught you that. Every word, raise your hand and say that, say every word preached with revelation led by the Holy Ghost, becomes my prophecy for my life. Are you ready? Therefore, verse number 1, chapter 4, John, if you're with us at home, thank God that you're watching. Therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, verse 2 says, though Jesus himself did not baptize but his disciples. So straight away we see here an assumption made by the critics that Jesus had baptized more disciples than John and the Bible very clearly says that there's a reason why the Bible put that in there so that we understand that even Jesus faced moments where people begin to criticize him and condemn him for things he was he never did how have you been there where well, you've been criticized and condemned just a hand, just not even uh, just one two two of us three of us okay just a few of us have been criticized and condemned over things that we didn't even touch that we didn't have anything to do with but we've been criticized and condemned over it though jesus himself did not baptize but his disciples verse 3 he left judea and departed again into galilee now i want you to look at the at, at the parallel of this particular verse Jesus left Judea. Judea, Judah, as we know, is to be praised or to be celebrated. But Judea specifically means he shall be praised. Jesus has been, even though criticized and condemned by the religious folk and the Pharisees, here he is. Now, they say that he is the one who has made more disciples than John the Baptist. And the Bible says, but Jesus didn't baptize him. His disciples did. In verse 3, it says he left Judea. Judea is he shall be praised. So even though the critics are giving him credit in a form of condemnation, Jesus has to leave the place where he is praised in order to get back into Galilee, which, is, which actually means a circuit. It's interesting to note that there are times in your life that you have to leave a place or a moment in your life and you have to shift. Because whenever somebody praises you, you got to ask, is it really sincere or is it flattery? Flattery is a demonic elevation. Write this down. Flattery is a demonic elevation that draws glory to self. Flattery is a demonic elevation that draws glory to self. That's why do not waste your words on flattery. Be sincere when you compliment somebody. Flattery is a demonic elevation that draws glory to self. It's not about how good I play on an instrument. It's about the gift that God has given me by His grace. And I can take that gift and I can, I can hide it because I don't want the world to see 
my gift or I don't want the church to see my gift. I don't want Christians to see my gift because it's for myself. But for as long as you hide it, you contaminate it. God never gave you anything to be hidden. He gave you things to be exposed. Every gift is to be exposed. Why? Because people will be blessed by what you have. What is your gift? What is your strength? So he leaves a place where he's been flattered. A place of demonic elevation because Jesus himself, the son of God knows, I can never remain in a place that brings glory to self. That's why he always said, I do nothing of myself. Everything I do, I do as my father. I only do what I see my father does. Is anybody in the house this morning? So when we look at, he leaves the place of Judea. He leaves the place where he shall be praised. And he departs and goes again into Galilee. Why? Why is Galilee known as a circuit? Why is it that Jesus moves from a place where he shall be praised to a place that is a circuit? Because you never break the cycle of your assignment. When you step into your calling, isn't it amazing? The distractions come. When you step into doing and, and making a commitment to doing what the Lord has called you, isn't it amazing that the distractions comes to break you out of the circuit? Offense comes, anger comes, bad attitude comes. And even if somebody else has a bad attitude, we take it personally and then we think that people are against us, not realizing that I'm here to help you with your bad attitude and your mad attitude as well. Can somebody shout amen? Are you here to help people? Are you here to help people? Nod your head if you can't say amen. Nod it vigorously, come on. Remind yourself that you cannot remain at a place of praise for self-glorification. You're going to move into the circuit of your assignment. Move into the circuit where you are a blessing. Because in the circuit of your assignment, you create unforgettable moments for others to take pleasure in. So then the Bible says, verse 4, but he needed to go to Samaria. So he came to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son, Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, sat thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. The Bible says Jesus was wearied from his journey. So that clearly tells us that he, at that moment, even though he operated for the majority of for all of his life, being led by God, being led by the Spirit of God, that even though he did all of that, he was still walking in the flesh on the earth. That's why he was wearied. Isn't it amazing when we get wearied in the body of Christ, we don't sit to rest our bodies. We sit to quit the ministry. If you believe that, I mean, I mean, really, if you agree with that, can you at least clap your hands? There are how many ministers have been wearied? How many leaders have been wearied? And they step down for a break, but the break is a quitting break. Am I right, saints of God? Because when you choose to step down to take a break, you've got to ask yourself, is it really, am I really wearied because of the ministry trip or the ministry that I've given out? Or is it because the devil is tiring me to cause me to quit. There are unforgettable moments. I'm taking you back to a place where you have not realized that that moment was the moment that you should have never opened the door to the devil. If you want to thrust, be thrust today into a quantum leap season of your life, let's deal with what needs to be dealt with hard and strong. I, I, I sense, I sense a lack of agreement this morning. Can we deal with what needs to be dealt with so that we can go further? As a church, do we want to go further? I still see empty seats. That means there are souls that still need to be won. I still see a lot of land. That means there's buildings that need to be built. I see a lot of open venues. That means there's souls that need to fill in the venues. Can somebody agree with me? I see a children's ministry that's not yet open, but in two weeks time, it's going to be open. Why? Because when I'm passionate about a dream, I throw everything into it. We have put more money into this property since the day we stepped in. We have put more money than the income of this church. <laughs> You're wondering how. It doesn't make mathematical sense. All the accountants, 
Well, you know, if I start showing figures, you'll think, you'll think oh goodness, uh, you are one crazy nutty pastor, not nutty professor, <laughs> but nutty pastor. How do you do it? Because I understand the principle of a quantum leap and I know if you're going to do it, God, I'm going to go out blazing because I know that my God will either do according to my faith and expectation and all I got to do is have my wife with me, not against me. And she's with me every step. And, and, and as a matter of fact, you think I'm crazy. She's even more crazy than I am. Come on now. Quantum leap. Somebody shout quantum leap. Shout unforgettable. Say that's my moment. So he came to the city of Samaria near the place where Jacob gave, gave to his son. And now Jacob's well was there. Meaning that Jacob obviously uh, uh, in his lifetime dug the hole. By the way, how old do you think he was when he wrestled with God? We always have the picture of a young boy wrestling with God, right? You know how old, how old Jacob was? Jacob was approximately around 78 years old when he wrestled with God. Isn't it amazing? Anybody 78 years old that can wrestle with God is a man of aggressive faith. Is a man that will never back down. He had all odds against him, yet he held on to God and said, I will not let go until you bless me this day. You know what Jacob was doing? He was making a demand in the time of his wilderness. He was making a demand on heaven that today I don't care how I've been deceptive. I don't care I stole my brother's blessing. I don't care I've been walking round and round the mountains of deceit and despair. But today I'm saying that I will rise up. I will rise up because I'm not letting go God until you bless me. I can walk with a limp on my hip because I wrestled with God. You gotta ask yourself, what is your limp? What is that place that God has touched in you that you walk with all the days of your life? What is that place of tears that never stop? Where is your place where you know the pain was unbearable? That's your limp. And it is your limp that reminds you I've wrestled with God in a season. And I said, God, I'm not letting go because I know that this is my quantum leap moment. Either you bless me or I die. Oh, come on now. Come on. Give God praise. Come on. When we look at this Jacob's well, it's a reminder of what Jacob fought or how Jacob fought with God. Because we see his lineage. We see he comes from Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. And God, when God reveals himself, begins to reveal himself, he revealed himself as what? As God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. All three generations have stood in line to receive a blessing of generations because God never goes back on his word God will never go back on his word I'm ready to receive from God this morning I have such a, an amazing unquenchable desire to see God move in this church and on this property like never before hallelujah so he came to the city verse 5 verse 6 now Jacob's well was there verse 7 a woman of Samaria came to draw water. Remember, Jesus is weary, he's tired. He's now at the place where he's traveled. It's quite a distance. And a woman of Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. The Bible never said that Jesus stopped because he was thirsty. It said Jesus stopped because he was tired. But he says, give me a drink. What was Jesus doing? He knew his assignment. And he was about to create an unforgettable moment in the Samaritan woman's life. How many times have Jesus showed up in your lowest moment and he was addressing you to answer a question and yet you ignored the instruction? Because there's so many things going on in your mind and in your life and you have so many things to complain about and your focus is so far away from the very purpose that God has called you to, that you cannot see through the cloud. You cannot see through the forest. You cannot see in the midst of your dark world because you're so caught up with everything that's going on around you. So a woman comes and Jesus says to her, give me a drink. Verse 8 says, for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Why was that necessary? Because it tells us very clear, clearly, Jesus was alone. He said, give me a drink. He didn't say, give us a drink. He said, give me a drink. And verse 9 says, Then the woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? 
for Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. How is it that you, a South African, is reaching to this God? How is it you, an African, is reaching to this God that they call the God of the Western world? At, at one point, they used to call him the God of the Western world. How is that you, from Africa, what they regard as a dark third world country, at one point, I don't know if they still do regard us as, as dark, dark third world country, but how is it that you can call on this God or, address, or listen to this God? How is it that you can have this God call on you? Called you by name. He knew you before you were formed in your mother's womb. He knitted you, he put your parts together, and he knew everything about you. Because Jesus knew what you would become for his glory. Verse 10 says, Jesus answered and said to him, If you knew the gift of God, do you know the gift of God? If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. How many times have God asked you to give something? How many times have God asked you to bring something to the altar? How many times have God said, put down a sacrifice? How many times have God said, sow and give out of your lack and see what God will do? Many times people are missing unforgettable moments that was scheduled by heaven to thrust them into a quantum leap season. And the reason is because they made excuses and that unforgettable moment became a missed opportunity for them. There are times that you have to sacrifice. There are times that you have to give because when you give into something of great exploits and you know it will achieve great exploits, you have to give a sacrificial offering in order to get you out of your mess. It's not that the church needs money or it needs your money. You need a breakthrough. That's what you give out of your need and you give and you sow whatever you can. If it's time, if time is all you have, sow your time. Sow your time. If money is what you have, give your money. If talents and gifts is what you have, give your talents and gifts. Because every moment that you do not show up is an unforgettable moment that you missed. Every moment that you do not show up with your gift, with an opportunity to sow, with an opportunity to give your time, to sow your talents and give. Every opportunity becomes a missed, unforgettable moment or an unforgettable moment that is missed. So the woman says to her, Sir, you have nothing to draw with. Jesus is trying to get her attention to the eternal stuff. She's looking at the natural. Anybody have been there? The natural becomes so big in your eyes. The natural problems is so great. And Jesus is trying to get you to look at the supernatural, the, His eternal word. Look at what you cannot touch with your physical hands, but you can touch with your faith. That's what Jesus is trying to get at. So the woman says to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? Who gave us the well? See, she didn't know that she's talking to the one that is that that wrestled with Jacob <laughs> come on now so are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well was it really Jacob who gave us the well where was the well where was the well in the ground who does the ground belong to Jehovah oh you missed a good place to shout who gave you the talent Jesus gave you the talent where's your well in you who gave it to you Jesus gave it. So guess what? You have to dig to get that well to produce. You have to dig to get that well to produce. Somebody shout Amen. Look at the person next to you and say, it's time to dig. Not your nose, but the well. Okay. <laughs> Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself as well as his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered and said to her, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. What is it? What are you saying? Don't look at the natural. Whoever drinks from this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will worry, will be in anxiety. What then? What's the glory for? Come on, Pastor Kenny, stay with us. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. Will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him 
a fountain, a well of water springing up. Is your Bible say well? Okay. A fountain of water, a well springing up into everlasting life. So what is Jesus saying? Whatever you take for, or whatever Jesus gives you, whatever God gives you, whatever the word gives you, it's not for you to keep. Raise your hand and say that. Say whatever revelation I get, whatever breakthrough I receive, it's not for me to keep, but it's for me to give. Hallelujah. So the woman said to him, sir, give me this living water that I may not thirst, nor come here to draw. Jesus takes her mind towards the supernatural and she keeps coming back to the natural. And so now Jesus is having literally a tough time trying to break through the stupidity of blockages that prevents us from seeing into the spirit world to an invisible God who is the only one that can give you an unforgettable moment. Come on somebody. So Jesus is having a tough time breaking down the walls in her mindset, breaking down the generational curses over her life, breaking down the things that, that could set her free because this woman didn't need a supernatural miracle in an instant. She needed to break down some curses that she has been carrying. <coughs> And Jesus says, now he, he sees she's keep going back to the natural. He says, okay, let's deal with the natural. What does Jesus do? He doesn't answer her according to her desire right there. Because he's got to deal. See, there are times that God cannot answer you according to your desire. He's got to bring you to the place to deal with the curses. That is preventing the supernatural. And you could be a Christian for 20 years, but there still could be something in your life. You can be a pastor for 20 years and there still could be something in your life that's preventing you in the natural from getting into the supernatural. So now Jesus says to this, uh, this woman says to Jesus, Sir, give me this water that I may not thirst nor come here to draw. Before we go to the next part of the verse, I want you to write this down. Unforgettable moments are often scheduled for those who drink from the eternal fountain of God's word. Unforgettable moments are often scheduled for those who drink from the eternal fountain of God's word. That's why I always say don't read your Bible and leave it there. Study the word. Read your Bible, study the word. Unforgettable moments are often scheduled for those who drink from the eternal fountain of God's word. See, revelation does not come unless you develop a hunger for the word, a hunger for deeper things of God. Revelation does not come when you're so caught up with your natural fleshly lusts of the flesh and you are feeding your face all the time, all of the junk from the world. Revelation doesn't come that way. Revelation does not come unless you develop a hunger and stay long enough in God's presence so that the Holy Spirit can satisfy the deep longing of your heart because you long why do you why do you have a deep longing i want to go deeper with god i want to encounter more of him i want to encounter greater moments in his presence that brings him pleasure i want to encounter deeper moments in his presence that will give him alone all the glory i want to hear his voice clearly and outside of the word i cannot hear him clearly but in the word, I can hear him clearly because I know how he speaks. Because outside of the word, the devil could become the deceptive voice in my life. But if I get more into his word and deeper into the revelation of his word, I begin to encounter more of him. So unforgettable moments are often scheduled for those who drink from the eternal fountain of God's word. Write this next thing down. When you drink from the waters of the Holy Scriptures, you will become the fountain that springs up into everlasting life. That's word. Everything I'm, I'm giving you is word. When you drink from the waters of the Holy Scriptures, you will become the fountain that springs up into everlasting life. Now notice when, when, you, when you drink from the Holy Bible, when you drink from the Holy Bible, when you drink from the revelation of the word automatically because you digesting the word the revelation of the word automatically when you speak out of your belly will come the revelation of everlasting life 
That's what the word says. So when you drink from the holy word, the holy scriptures, you will become the fountain that springs up into everlasting life. So it means that if I'm drinking from the word, every word that comes out of my mouth will become everlasting word, not temporary word. I'm going through trouble. Is that everlasting or temporal? Everyone shout out loud. Okay, it doesn't take a lot of thinking to figure that out. If I'm drinking from the Holy Word, the Holy Bible, right? And every time I drink from the Bible, that means when I speak, I'm going to speak everlasting word. So if I'm going to say, I'm in so much of trouble, I don't know how to get out of it. Is that everlasting word or is that temporary word? Everyone shout aloud, temporary word. You, you know, I remember in school, we used to talk like that because we were so uncertain of the answer. I gave you the answer before I even asked you the question. If you drink from the everlasting word, when you speak, what will come out of you? Everlasting word. So if I say that I'm in so much of trouble, I don't know how to get out of it. Guess what's, what, what am I speaking? Am I speaking everlasting word or temporary word? If I say, I don't know how I'm going to face tomorrow. Is that temporary word or is that everlasting word? But what if I change my language and say, we're going to make it. We're going to have all the money we need to settle this building in a year. Is that temporal or everlasting? <laughs> in the natural, it seems like it is impossible. But in the supernatural, the everlasting word, it's very possible. That's why I call this message, I believe by the leading of the Holy Spirit, unforgettable. My time for a quantum leap. Can somebody please shout glory to God? <clears throat> because the amen seems monotonous now. Come on, it sounds monotone. Let's shout glory to God. Give it some life. Give it some life. Give it some everlasting life. Hallelujah. When you drink from the waters of the Holy Scriptures, you will become the fountain that springs up into everlasting life. What is the fountain that springs forth to everlasting life? What is the fountain? Everyone say this, it is the Holy Spirit. Say the Holy Spirit in me is the everlasting Word of God that comes out of me. Say it again, the Holy Spirit in me is the everlasting Word of God that comes out of me. Say it again, the Holy Spirit in me is the everlasting Word of God that comes out. So when you drink from the waters of the Holy Scriptures, you will become the fountain that springs forth. Do we have a scripture to back up that principle? Do I have a scripture? Yes, we do. John chapter 7. Verse number 37 to 39. <clears throat> John chapter 7, verse 37 to 39. It says here, on the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out saying, if anyone thirsts, if anyone thirsts, you see, if you're not thirsty, there's no need for water. If anyone thirsts, is anybody thirsty? Is anybody thirsty for God? Some of you are nodding your head like, like you're not even sure if you're thirsty. Is anyone thirsty for the Word of God? Let heaven hear you. <clears throat> Let heaven hear you. On the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Not if anyone was thirsty. Not if anyone might be thirsty, but if anyone thirsts right now in this moment, in this unforgettable moment. Are you thirsty in this unforgettable moment? Are you thirsty in this unforgettable moment? Huh? Are you thirsty right now? So in other words, Jesus says, in the present situation, wherever you might be in life, if you are thirsty, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. <clears throat> Not only come to Jesus. See, many Christians are standing by Jesus, but they're not thirsty enough to come and take and drink. You're standing by Jesus. You come to church. You use your talents and your gifts to glorify God, but you are not thirsty enough to come and, and, come and drink. So you come into His presence, but you don't drink of the Holy Spirit. You come into His presence and you fall asleep in church and you do not memorize or write down the notes or keep it in your mind. And as a result, when you walk out, you forget. You forget the revelation. You forget what's being taught. And when you face a challenge tomorrow, you don't know what word to use. 
because you thought the pastor was singing a lullaby while he was preaching and you fell asleep in church. But this pastor don't sing lullabies. He hits you hard with the word. Okay, none of you like that, so it's fine. Look, if you want to go to a religious church, you, I'm releasing you, go. <laughs> Raise your hand and say, I say, I'm not, I'm not in religion. I'm in relationship with the Holy God. Say it again, I'm not into religion. I'm into relationship with the Holy God. He, verse 38, chapter 7 of John, He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of stinking water. Rivers of what? Living water. Not contaminated water. Living water. Every time your Christian friend opened up their mouth, did it stink like it was contaminated words? Not, not, not talking about the breath. Did it stink like contaminated words or did it smell like living waters? That Christian needs help. You watching from home. If you are hanging, out, hanging around Christians that speak death, that speak fear, they have not encountered a relationship with God and they are not thirsty enough. Because for every problem, as you know, we preach this all the time, for every problem, there is a scriptural solution to take you out of the mess that you are in. For every challenge, there is always a scriptural solution for you and I. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water, not trickles. I get up in the morning and I praise God. And I'm excited about the day. And the first sign of attack, the rest of my day is ruined. And all I'm doing is speaking out stinking waters, contaminated waters. Oh, the, uh, the flu is going to get me. Oh, I'm going to die. Oh, my heart is pain and going to have a heart attack and die. My blood pressure is high. My knee got a headache. My toes got a backache. And you don't know, you talk so much of negative, you don't know which thing belongs where. <laughs> Like I remember the days when I was little and I would listen to the conversations, not little, little, but I mean like a teenager. And I listen to the conversations when family get with family gatherings. How are you doing, mommy? Or, you know, whatever they call, or auntie or uncle. Oh, I've had a rough week. Blood pressure is high. My knees paining, the arthritis. And everything is mine. My arthritis, my headache, my backache, my pressure. So they take possession. In other words, what they do is they, they talk as if they have a title deed to every sickness and disease. And I said, wonder, my good. And as soon as that lady stops talking, the other auntie says, oh, I also went through a rough time. My pressure was sky high. What was your pressure? So now we spend a whole bunch of time comparing the readings on our pressure machines. Now just about everybody has a pressure machine in the house because it's so cheap. And we have, have all of those machines, those portable machines that can work its, its, its mojo when we need it. But you've got to get to the place where you say, I refuse to agree with the contamination of the world and I want to speak the living waters but I don't want to speak trickles of living water I want to speak what according to the word rivers what you know rivers is not a lake you, you figure that out see how much you learn when you come to church rivers is not a lake rivers is not a stream but a stream can become a river but every stream flows into a river and every river flows into the sea. Why does Jesus want us to be rivers of living water? Why? Because we can create an ocean of blessing. So we can create a well of blessing. So we can have a fountain. It is your words that are preventing your breakthrough. It's your words that are preventing your breakthrough. Somebody shout unforgettable. My time for a quantum leap. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water but this he spoke concerning the spirit concerning what what was the principle when you drink from the waters of the holy scriptures you will become the fountain that springs up into everlasting life what is that fountain it is the holy spirit the bible says here yeah, he who believes in me as the scripture has said out of his heart will flow rivers of living water but this he spoke concerning the spirit say this again say the holy spirit in me Put your, put your hand on your heart. If you don't know where your heart is, just put it in the middle. <laughs> Say, the Holy Spirit in me creates a fountain of everlasting word that comes out of me. 
Say, out of me will flow from this moment rivers of living water. Because the Holy Spirit dwells in me, I will never agree with the devil and his lies. But I come into agreement with the revelation of the Holy Word of my unforgettable God. Do you want to miss an opportunity to praise God? Do you want to miss an opportunity to praise God? Come on, praise God. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, concerning the Spirit whom those believing in him would receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. That last part of the verse is very important. The last part of that scripture. What does it say? Everybody together, let's read from the screen. The last part, or read verse 39. One, two, three. Read it again. Hallelujah. Do you notice the lost part there? For the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. Do you know what restricts you from listening and receiving from the Holy Spirit? You stop glorifying God. Think about it. What was the highlight of yesterday's conversations that you had? What was the highlight? Just think about it. Take a, you don't tell me. I don't want to know your secrets. Just tell me. <laughs> tell me. What was the highlight? Uh, just, um, tell yourself. What was the highlight? What was the highlight of yesterday's conversation? And now think about it. How much of God glorification were there in that conversation? How much did you glorify God in the middle of that conversation? Was yesterday filled with glorifying God? Because if you glorify the devil, then guess who's going to speak louder in your life? The devil. See? It's like a mathematical equation that I'm putting together for you this morning. A solution to your problems. A solution so you'll never be down again. A solution so you'll never worry again. A solution so that you can move into an unforgettable moment of a quantum leap with God. Somebody shout Amen. So what do you need to do? Glorify Jesus. See, Jesus was glorified. That's where the Holy Spirit came. But whenever you stop glorifying Jesus, stop glorifying the Word, stop glorifying your unforgettable God, whenever you do that, what happens? The Spirit becomes silent in your ears. You can't hear Him. You get deafened with the wax of negative reports. Your ears are deaf and, be, and you can't see beyond the challenge that you're facing. This is your unforgettable moment. Are you thirsty enough? Are you thirsty enough? You gotta be thirsty all the time. Whoever thirsts, come, let him come to me and drink. Are you thirsty enough? Are you looking for the right waters to drink from? Are you drinking from a contaminated, from contaminated waters filled with fear? Are you drinking from contaminated wa waters filled with worry? filled with anxiety. What are you drinking from? Contaminated waters of negative reports. What are you drinking from? Shout out loud, please. I am thirsty for fresh waters. I'm thirsty for holy waters. I am thirsty for a deeper revelation of God's word. You don't sound like you're thirsty. If you was in a desert and you had no water to drink, you will understand what thirst is all about. You will understand what it's like to be thirsty and to, to begin to dehydrate because you have no waters to drink from. Many people who go to churches that preach without revelation and they just tickle you. Those people are in a state of spiritual dehydration. See, that's why when you are in a church that doesn't feed you revelation of the word, you have to run. Are you hearing me at home? If you're listening to word that doesn't feed you, doesn't, doesn't give you revelation of the word, doesn't talk about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, which is the very basis of our Christian faith, 
Pentecostal, whatever denomination. If you call yourself Christ, like Christ told, spoke about the Holy Spirit. So we have to talk about the Holy Spirit. He gave us the Holy Spirit to quench our spiritual thirst. So we have to have the Holy Spirit living on the inside of us. So when you are doubtful and you don't know what decisions to make, you just take a moment and you say, Father, I thank you that the Holy Spirit leads and guides me into all truth to make the right decision. To make the right decision. Somebody shout Amen. Jesus, or write this down, those who refuse to drink from the revelation of God's Holy Word will suffer spiritual dehydration. We got that one? Those who refuse to drink from the revelation of God's Holy Word will suffer spiritual dehydration. Now remember the woman at the well? We got to the point where in verse number 15, Jesus begins to not deal with her natural side because she, he's trying to get her to think supernatural and she's thinking natural. Here's what Jesus does. Verse, chapter 4, verse number 16 again. Jesus said to her, go call your husband and come here. Do you still need that principle up? Are you still writing? How <coughs> if you need more time? Everyone's good? Okay, done. Shout down if you're done. All right. <clears throat> Those who refuse to drink from the revelation of God's word will suffer spiritual dehydration. Let's go back to chapter 4 of John. Jesus said to her, verse 16, Go call your husband and come here. <clears throat> the woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You have well said. I have no husband. For you have had five husbands. Hey, after five husbands, we don't know what happened to them. They probably died. But after five, after she killed five husbands, what are you still doing with that woman? <laughs> For you have had five husbands, and the one whom you now have is not your husband. In that you spoke truly. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Hmm? You know, when I was dating Pastor Shemaine, eight months, the most uncomfortable thing that I ever faced was introducing her to people. I don't know what to introduce her as. I'm thinking, first I started with a girlfriend. I thought, oh, that, no, no, sorry. First you start with friend. She's my friend. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Just my friend. Yeah, you have ulterior motives, but nobody knows about that. But Jesus knows. <laughs> Just my friend, right? My sister Shemaine is here. Amazing, I've got to marry somebody with the same name. That's my sister. You know, it was three years now, coming on three years, and, and the, she came to visit the one day, and she says to her, I don't know if you remember it, Shemaine, but we're standing in the, in the kitchen, in my kitchen, and, and she said, she says, what's happening? You don't have anybody yet. I said, no, there probably is somebody. She says, really? Now, now she's like shocked. It's been three years. She's totally shocked. Never saw me with a girl for those three years. And so I said, I'll show you a photograph. So I'll show her the photograph. She looks at the photograph. She says to me, and this girl likes you, because that was a beautiful photograph. <laughs> it's like... Trust a sister to say something like that instead of saying, she's so lucky. <laughs> but so first it was my friend and then it's my girlfriend. And then I'm, I'm feeling so uncomfortable with all of these words. Then, you know, put a ring on the finger. Then it's my fiance. <laughs> Getting their mail in. Don't give up hope. Jake, Jake was 78 years old when he wrestled with God and got the blessing. Somebody shout hallelujah. <laughs> There's hope for you. There's hope for you. <laughs> I remember there, were, there was a, uh, a guy that was a friend of ours in, in the other church we served in. And he was single for a long time. He was a professor. And I said, hey, come on, professor. I said, man, here's this, this auntie here. Come on. Now, she's been in the church a long time. She's, she's single, you know. He says, no, Pastor Verve. He says, the mileage is too high on that one. <laughs> <laughs> I was finished, man. I... <laughs> I was, I cracked up with this, with this professor. And so I said to him, I said, no, no, hold on, hold on. I said, we can try and turn the clock backward. <laughs> you know, just patch up the face and that's turning the clock backward. <laughs> so somebody shout, there's hope for me. My quantum leap moment is now. 
So Jesus said to her, go call your husband. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you have well said. So what was Jesus doing? Jesus was dealing with the natural that was preventing her from seeing the supernatural. And Jesus had to deal with that. Jesus was preparing the Samaritan woman for an unforgettable moment in her life. A moment where she will encounter a quantum leap that would leave behind her past failures. A past failures in marriage, a past failures in relationship. He was dealing with this. He needed her to come out with the truth of admission because she's dealing with five, gener or five men who had generational curses that prevented a, or caused a blockage in her life that will prevent her from seeing the supernatural unforgettable moment where Jesus was offering her waters where she will never thirst again. So her need was not the waters in the well, but her need was the waters of the Holy Word. Whatever breakthrough you need is not in the natural, it is in the well of the Word of Revelation. If you can catch that, if that's all you catch today, you are ready for next week. You are ready for this week. You are ready to encounter major breakthroughs, quantum leap moments. And in closing this morning, I want you to, I want to, and I'll go deeper next week, but I want you to write these five meetings to the word quantum leap. Some of you may have never heard that word before. Quantum leap, here's what it means. Five, five things I'm going to give you. Number one, Quantum leap, the word or the phrase quantum leap, it means an abrupt transition. Did I give you that note? No, forgot to give you that one. An abrupt transition. Quantum leap, an abrupt, you know how to spell quantum? Q-U-A-N-T-U-M, okay? Quantum leap, an abrupt transition. That's number one, an abrupt transition. Number two, it means sudden increase. Sudden increase. Pastor Iris calls it suddenly. I love that when, when we were, uh, didn't have a, spirit, a home, a physical property, we had our things in storage. Pastor Iris says, Dr. Verve, our suddenly is coming. Suddenly God's going to give us a church. Suddenly God's going to give us a property. And guess what? That's exactly what happened. Why? She drinks from, not Pastor Kenny's well, she drinks from the Holy Word. Hallelujah. <laughs> Uh, so sudden increase number three dramatic advance dramatic advance number three dramatic advance number four a great improvement quantum leap a great improvement it sounds like bingo eh <laughs> number <laughs> number five a highly significant breakthrough a highly significant breakthrough so when i when i said in the beginning that this message is hashtag unforgettable remember when you were hashtagging on all social media platforms make sure you hashtag your church you hashtag hashtag excellence in national ministries in one word hashtag eim that's a acronym for excellence in national ministries right you got to hashtag everything to do with your church that's how you market and promote your church and get people who are backslidden to come to this, the, to come back to the house of God. So everybody got that? So when I said unforgettable, hashtag unforgettable, my time for a quantum leap, this is exactly what this word is about. How many of you are ready for an abrupt transition? How many of you are ready for a sudden increase? How many of you are ready for dramatic advance? How many ready for, and not, not not dramatic advance, not drama queen advance, dramatic advance. A great improvement, anybody? You ready for a great improvement? You ready for a highly significant breakthrough? This is it. This is the moment and this is the time that we are ready to transition and move further. 